everybody. Today's service is starting in one minute. And today our pastor's teaching is titled, The Sleigh. So let's find our seats, turn our phones on silent, and let's get ready to worship our Lord. and welcome to this morning's worship experience. For those of you who don't know who I am, my name's Alyssa and I'm the Director of Community Connections here at Vantage Point Community Church. I am so excited that you're joining us today. Thank you so much for spending some of your day with us. If you are joining us for the first time, I encourage you to please fill out one of those connect cards, which is in the seat pocket in front of you. And for all of you who are joining us online, welcome. We're excited that you are here. Please comment and let us know that you're joining us in community today. For tithes and offerings this morning, you can send an e-transfer to vpcctreasurer at outlook.com, or you can place your tithes and offerings in the boxes located in the sanctuary. I have some exciting events happening this month, all in celebration of Christmas. First of all, I know that it has been advertised that there is a Christmas banquet happening on Friday, December 9th. This banquet is no longer happening, it's being postponed until the spring, but do not fret because our youth and our community small groups are having a potluck. This is open to everyone who would like to come on out. It's free. All you need to bring is your favorite Christmas dish. Whatever you love to have at Christmas, come bring, come share. It's happening on Friday, December 16th. Again, it's a potluck for everyone to come on out. There will also be an opportunity for you guys to stick around and play some games if you would like to. But again, everyone's welcome. All ages are welcome. December 16th, which is a Friday night potluck here at the church. And if you want any more information, please talk to Tanya Fedora or Rachel Reisdyke. Also happening this month is our two Christmas services. First of all, Christmas Eve at 6.30 p.m., come on out for our annual candlelight service. This is going to be a traditional service and we will be talking about the prophets of Christmas and we do hope that you will join us and bring your friends and family. And then come on back Christmas morning at 11 a.m. as we tell the story and as we wish Jesus a very happy birthday. So please come on out again Christmas Eve at 6.30 p.m. and Christmas Day at 11 a.m. and we just cannot wait to celebrate this season with you. I just want to take a moment just to remind you all about two ways you're able to help us out, get back to our community. One way is our mitten tree. If you're able to help us out there, you can bring in mittens, hats, and scarves, and we'll be donating those to people who need it most this winter. We're also looking at putting together some food hampers, and these food hampers will go to families in our community that need just a little extra cheer. So if you're able to help us there, you can grab yourself an ornament, purchase the item on the ornament, and then bring it back. And we'll be putting together these hampers in time for Christmas. For all other events and announcements, please make sure you're checking your bulletin, follow us on Facebook, and please check out our website, which is vantagepointcc.org. Now let's get this service started. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley will be raised up. Every mountain and hill will be made low. The rough ground shall become level. The rugged places a plain. And the glory of the Lord will be revealed. And all people will see it together. For thus saith the Lord. Uh, sorry. A voice in a, in, of one calling the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. All will see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Amen. <laughs> Born King, peace 
from the sky and stay by my side until morning is night. Glory to God, I count on the sands. Glory of peace on earth. You left your throne to live like I do.
our tradition of taking the Lord's Supper, even when we are celebrating something like Christmas. It's hard to separate that Jesus came for the sole purpose of dying for our sins. We take the elements. They are common. What was on the table that night, as Jesus talked to his disciples about what the church was going to be like in the years to come. And Jesus told his disciples that this bread is my body and it has been given for you. Take, eat, and remember. In the same way, he took the cup. He said, this is my blood, the blood of the new covenant, a new promise between God and man. Take, drink, and remember. Father, we are thankful that you came that Christmas, walked with us, dwelt with us, lived as we do, also that you could die for us, paying the penalty for our sin. And we are thankful, Father, that you would do this. We are thankful, Jesus, that you would make the sacrifice for us. And we just pray that you would be with us, that you would shape us, that every day we would become just a little bit more like you. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. What hope we hold this solid night The King is born in Bethlehem A journey long we seek the light leads to the in manger ground. What fear we felt in the silent age, for hundred years can he be found? But broken by the baby's cry.
of John. So last week we started off with waiting for Santa Claus. I know some of you were offended by that, but the truth is that the world needs more people like Santa. And the original Saint Nicholas was simply a generous man who wanted to share the light of Christ with the people that were around him. And so we are charged to do the same thing. Share our light with those that are around us. Our presence, we, we become Jesus with skin on to those that we meet. It seems like a big task, and it is, but we need to remember that God is with us. Part of what this whole Christmas season is about is that God came and made his dwelling among us and that he lives with us enabling us to do what he needs us to do. We don't do this on our own power. We do it with, with him. And this week we're going to talk about the sleigh, and I know it's already got some people confused. I had one guy ask me yesterday, what text are you using for that? I said, oh, we'll still be in John. It's okay. I said, just, just come and listen. You'll, you'll be fine. I won't embarrass you too badly, I hope. That's only my wife that gets embarrassed by what I say, but, you know, that's... Maybe a little bit different. You don't get it. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> a couple weeks ago, I was sitting with my grandkids, and we decided that we wanted to watch the Christmas Chronicles again. This is the first one. It was released in 2018, uh, and it's a story about Santa. I guess that's kind of hard to guess from the picture, isn't it? Um. It's really a story about a family, and the family um, is going through some hard times. Dad is a firefighter, but Dad passed away fighting a fire. So it leaves Mom and, and the two kids, uh, Teddy and Kate, to try to get their way through the Christmas season. And Teddy is, is a little bit bitter because Dad's died, and, and he doesn't want to, you know, do this Christmas thing anymore. Uh, so, Christmas stories always seem to be somehow about somebody's restoration. In this case, it would be Teddy. But on Christmas Eve, mom is called into work because somebody got sick, and so she has to leave. She's not going to be there. She promises the kids, I'll be here in the morning. We'll open up the presents and celebrate Christmas, but I've got to go for the night. Kate, which is the youngest, decides that she wants to prove that Santa Claus is real. And so she sets up a camera to start taking pictures of whatever goes on in that living room that night. And sure enough, Santa shows up, and Kate follows him out and finds the reindeer in the sleigh, and then Kate jumps into the sleigh. Meanwhile, Teddy's trying to figure out where his sister is, and he goes out and sees her waving to him from the sleigh. Santa Claus is inside delivering presents at this point. And so Teddy runs and jumps into the sleigh as well. And then the two of them go on a great um, adventure with Santa Claus. If, you know, there are a lot of reasons to watch the movie, uh, but one of them is probably just simply this. Um, if you want uh, to listen to Steve Van Zandt, formerly of uh, the E Street, uh, e Street Band, uh, Bruce Springsteen, well, this is his new band, uh, Little Stevie and the Disciples of Soul. They, when Santa Claus gets thrown into jail, he gets thrown into jail with the Disciples of Soul. They're all kind of messed up on Christmas. And then Santa Claus, you know, out of, out of thin air, produces guitars and amps and drums. And then these, you know, Steve, little, little Stevie and, and his bandmates... Uh, get to play behind, with Santa Claus singing the lead in the jail cell. It's enough. I, 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 enjoy, I thoroughly enjoyed that moment of the movie. Um, but eventually they get Santa out of jail, but 
these kids are on this adventure, which include losing the sleigh, losing the reindeer. Of course, the, 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 the episode where Santa gets to go into jail. Um, they are so behind that they're not sure they can catch up. And Santa decides he needs their help. And so at one point, Kate, the little girl, is told that she needs to go and get the elves to help. And she said, well, how do I do that? And Santa says, just go into the bag that's on the sleigh. And so she goes into this bag on the sleigh, and she starts crawling, and she finds out that this thing is like endless. In fact, it it produces a tunnel straight to the North Pole where she meets the elves, and then the posse comes back uh, with her to save Christmas and Santa Claus. This morning, really what I want to, want to kind of leave with you, so I'll give you this before you fall asleep, and then you can fall asleep and you won't have missed anything, but here's, here's really what I want us to get to. The Word became flesh, the incarnation, Jesus Christ, was the first gift of Christmas. And just like that bag, there is a depth to Jesus that we often don't get to understand. We kind of are satisfied with the surface. And we, we, and we miss everything else that, that God, through Jesus Christ, has for us. And we're going to stay, we're, this whole series is going to be in John 1, so we're going to stay in John 1, but we're going to start reading at verse 14. Verse 14, John says this, The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified concerning him. He cried out, saying, This is the one I spoke about when I said, He who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. Out of his fullness we have all received grace in place of the grace already given. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God but the one and only Son, who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. If you're trying to keep filling that blanks, that first one is just the tabernacle. It seems almost countercultural or intuitive to talk about Christmas. We have to go back to Moses. But really, we can't talk about Christmas without understanding everything that came before understand is what happened at the tabernacle. So we have this people that have escaped Egypt. They were slaves. And they've wandered out of Egypt, and they are now in in, in the the desert, in the wilderness, and they're trying to figure out what comes next. They've got a leader named Moses. And they come to a mountain, Mount Sinai, and Moses tells the people that God has come and is going to meet with you. He wants to meet with Israel right here in this place. And there's some thunder and there's smoke on the mountain. And the people get scared. And so finally, the people come up to Moses. When the people saw the thunder and lightning and heard the trumpet and saw the mountain and smoke, they trembled with fear and they they stayed at a distance and said to Moses, speak to us yourself. We will listen, but do not have God speak to us, or we will die. Then I will have them make us, oh, let's let's just stay there. Um, So here we are. Israel has gathered at the foot of Mount Sinai. God has come to meet with them, and all of a sudden they see the Steven Spielberg's you know, show going off on the mountain. And they decide, listen, Moses, you're a good guy. But we don't want to get close to that. We want you to go. We want you to go and tell us what it is that God says. Don't have God speak directly to us. We're going to hide over here. You go and and meet with God, then come in, and we'll believe you. I mean, we've, we've seen the smoke, we've seen the lightning. We'll believe whatever you tell us, but, but we don't want to hear it. And so that's exactly what happens. Mountain goes up, or mountain. Moses goes up on the mountain, 
and he starts to talk with God. And he's up there for a while. And God gives to Moses the Ten Commandments. But he also starts talking about some other things that Israel needed to do to stay in line with God, to enjoy God. And so they just continually started to you know, develop these things that, would, that Israel would need to do that went beyond the Ten Commandments. You know, love the Lord your God with all your mind, soul, and strength. Love your neighbor. They were all in there. And so Moses is up on the mountain. He's receiving all of this stuff. I'm sure it was kind of like you know, trying to drink water out of a fire hose. It just kind of you know, kept coming at him. And part of what God told him was that he needed to build a a tabernacle. And this tabernacle would be the place where God would come and would dwell among them. In Exodus 25, God says this, Then have them make a sanctuary for me, and I will dwell among them. I will be with them. So what happened is that this this tabernacle was going to be the center of life in Israel. Uh, They're they're moving around the wilderness. They're they're, they're a a nomadic people at this point. So the the tent of of God can be torn down and it can be moved and placed somewhere else. And, And the tribes would gather around. Each tribe had the particular place where they were supposed to be. And it would be around this this tabernacle, which existed kind of like in downtown. It was at the center of everything. And the priests would minister before God, and the people would come and bring their offerings. And this would be central to the life of, of, of Israel. And so God says, listen, just go to them. Tell the people to bring offerings to you. If you need some gold, silver, bronze, all sorts of cloth, you know, whatever they have, whatever they will donate, take. In an amazing turn, the people actually brought too much. And Moses had to say, oh, stop it. I think we've got enough now. I think we, we, can build a, we can build the tabernacle. We don't need any more offerings. But they, were just, they just kept on bringing these offerings because they wanted to have this, this tabernacle that would be in their midst and that God would dwell among them. Really, from Exodus 25 to Exodus 40, the end of the, end, end of the book, we have just simply the, the descriptions of the tabernacle. This is what it's supposed to be like. This is the measurements. This is what you're supposed to do. And then at the end, in Exodus 40, we have this story. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses could not enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled on it. And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. So God has decided that there is going to be this thing called the tabernacle, and he is going to live there. And he is going to dwell among his people. And the glory of the Lord, once this tabernacle gets built, the glory of the Lord, which is really a signal of God accepting it, just simply falls on this tabernacle. And not even Moses can go inside. Everybody has to stay out until God is done with whatever he's doing. Let me read again from John. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. He came to make his dwelling among us. And he has been filled with glory. There are different kinds of Bible translations, and they try to accomplish different things. So on one end, we have uh, what we call literal translations, which try as best as possible to to just take the words out of the original language and write them down. Then we have more paraphrases up on this end that that try to get, get at the heart of the meaning of whatever was being said. I love what Young's literal, so it's way over here. Young's literal says about this passage. This is the way he translates it. And the word became flesh and did tabernacle among us. And we beheld his glory, 
glory as of an only begotten of a father, full of grace and truth. Hear it? Jesus came to tabernacle among us, to make his dwelling, just like the tabernacle did in the Old Testament. He, He came to make his dwelling among us, to celebrate with us, to walk with us. He is with us. God has come to meet with man. And the glory was there. Again, this is Exodus 40. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. So there's the glory of God in in the Old Testament that falls on the tabernacle, meaning that God has accepted the tabernacle. And then there's the glory of God that falls on Jesus, meaning that Jesus has accepted his ministry and who he is. That next blank, I just want you to write down glory, the glory. So sometimes this is something we need to sort of kind of unpack. And again, glory is really kind of just this idea of acceptance of God. I want to take you a bit of a journey through the Old Testament this morning as we look at this, but I have a bit of a struggle with sometimes what we believe, and part of it is about the temple. See, the tabernacle worked for a while, but then David wanted to build a, build, build a temple. He, he said, well, I live in a, in a brick-and-mortar house. I, 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 have a, I have a great palace in which I live in, and my God lives in a tent. I want to make a, a, a brick-and-mortar house for God. I, I, want to, I want to make it a beautiful palace that God lives in. And so he goes to the priest, Nathan, and, and he says, I want to do this. And Nathan says, yeah, go do it. Sounds good. And then God comes to Nathan and says, why did you do that? I don't want a temple. You go back to David and you tell him that he's not the one to build a, a, a house for me. The tabernacle's okay. So Nathan goes back and tells, um, tells David this. The Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. Can I read that again? The Lord declares that to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. When your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name. And I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father and he will be my son. And when he does wrong, I will punish him with a rod wielded by men, with floggings inflicted by human hands. But my love will never be taken away from him. So I, as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed from, who I removed from before you. Your house... Where did I go? Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. David hears these words, and he thinks he's talking about Solomon. I read these words, and I think, "Uh uh-uh, he's talking about Jesus. Solomon's throne was not forever. Jesus is his. This is, this, is, this is God speaking to David saying, I will raise up somebody. You don't have to worry about this. And he will build the temple that I want. But it's not you. So David, just go off and play with your stuff. I think I really have this idea that you know, God hoped that David would just forget about this. But David didn't. David started to draw up plans for this house, and he started to have meetings with Solomon. I'm sure it was a bedtime story time. He, he, he'd, he'd tell stories of this temple that he dreamt was going to be built for his God. So Solomon grew up with this idea that, that he would build a temple for God. And so when David finally dies and Solomon kind of comes 
into his reign on his own, the first thing he's got to think about is that I have to build a temple. Or the second thing. I think he built a palace first. And then he built a temple for God. But I'm convinced that God never really wanted the temple. That wasn't his intention in this whole thing. He was fine in the tabernacle dwelling among us. He knew that he was going to send Jesus at some point who would tabernacle among us and make his place of worship in our hearts. He didn't need a a brick and stone mortar. A brick and stone building, sorry. All he needed was just simply willing hearts, and Jesus would come, and, and that would happen. But a temple was built. And we do have this. The priests then brought the Ark of the Lord's Covenant to its place in the inner sanctuary of the temple, the most holy place, and put it under the wings of the cherubim. And just pause here. The tabernacle was supposed to house the Holy of Holies. The tabernacle, at this point, did not have it because they had lost it to the Philistines and then they had gotten it back. And when they finally took it back to Jerusalem, David built a special tent for the Holy of Holies in Jerusalem. He didn't want it far away. So right now, the the, the tabernacle doesn't have the Holy of Holies in it. A tent in Jerusalem does. But now as they decommission the tabernacle and start to, to concentrate on the temple, they bring the Holy of Holies back to where it was supposed to be in the first place, this Art of the Covenant. The cherubim spread their wings over the place of the Ark and overshadowed the Ark and its carrying poles. These poles were so long that their ends could be seen from the holy place in front of the inner sanctuary, but not from the, from the outside of the holy place. And they are still there today. There was nothing in the ark except the, two, except the two stone tablets that Moses had placed in it at Horeb, where the Lord made a covenant and the Israelites after they had, with the Israelites after they had come out of Egypt. When the priests withdrew from the holy place, the cloud filled the temple of the Lord. When the priests could not perform their, and the priests could not perform their service because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled his temple. God may not have wanted the temple, but he accepted it. And the glory of the Lord fills his temple, again, so that even the priests can't go in and do their their work. God has accepted this, this stone building in Jerusalem, as his. And so the priests began to minister in front of this temple in Jerusalem. And to be honest, over the next years, centuries, the temple would fall on hard times. There were some kings that didn't pay any attention to it at all. It, it, it became a place in disrepair. It needed a lot of fixing. And some kings just didn't do anything about that. Other kings like Josiah came in and said, we've got to repair the temple. We've got to fix it up and bring it back to its former glory. And so they would come and they would treat this temple with, you know, careful hands and start to restore everything that was there. But eventually, it came to the point where God invited Nebuchadnezzar in to Jerusalem. And he destroyed the temple. And he destroyed Jerusalem. He tore everything down so that not one stone lay on another. And this whole idea of a temple for God disappeared. The year was 586 CE. Or BCE, sorry. And now the temple of Solomon was gone. The people were in exile. Those who were left, left for Egypt, basically leaving the, the Judah an empty place. And then 70 years later, the people started coming back. And the first thing they did was they wanted to build a new temple. And so they did. This is from Ezra. With praise and thanksgiving, they sang to the Lord. He is good. His love toward Israel endures forever. And all the people 
gave a great shout of praise to the Lord because the foundation of the house of the, of the Lord was laid. But many of the older priests and Levites and family heads who had seen the former temple wept aloud when they saw the foundation of this temple being laid, while many others shouted with joy. No one could distinguish the sound of the shouts of joy from the sound of weeping because the people made so much noise and the sound was heard far away. We have the beginnings of the building of the second temple. Sometimes we call it Zerubbabel's temple because Zerubbabel was the governor at this point. Zerubbabel would have been king if there was still a king in Israel, but there wasn't. And so we see that the, that the foundations are laid and that this temple is being built, but it doesn't measure up to Solomon's. It's not as big as Solomon's. There's no Ark of the Covenant anymore. That's been gone. There's no holy fire. There's no holy oil. All the things that they needed to, to run the sacrificial system for Israel was gone. And we are missing this idea that God would accept the temple. There's no mention of glory falling on the second temple. The Bible doesn't say that. According to the Bible, it is just a building. And that that wasn't missed by the prophets. Here's what Haggai says. The glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house, says the Lord Almighty. And in this peace, I will grant peace. And in this place, I will grant peace, declares the Lord Almighty. It's not there yet, but the glory is coming. And it will be greater than the glory of Solomon's temple. Don't worry. God's got a plan. So Herod comes up, and Herod starts to, to, to expand the temple during his reign, around the time of Jesus. He starts to expand the temple. He wants to make it more ornate. He wants it to make it something that everybody's going to talk about. But it still does not have the glory of God resting on it until something else happened. When the time came for the purification rites required by the law of Moses, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn, firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is, it, with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. Now, there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout, and he was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. And when the priest brought, the child, brought in the child, Jesus, to do for him what, was, what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light of revelation for the Gentile and the glory of your people, Israel. Finally, the glory had returned to the temple in the form of a baby Jesus. Again, John says it, says it as well. For the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Finally, the glory that was missing had been returned. The next blank is this plastic Jesus. I love, I read a few blogs, and one of them is from Reverend Dr. Janet Hunt. She has a, a blog she calls Dancing with the Word, and I, I like to read it once in a while when I can. I, I, I read a, a post by her that was 
actually almost a decade old. She had written it just after Christmas that year. And she started talking about this idea that the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. And so she talked about a Christmas in the barn celebration that they had on Christmas Eve. The idea was, let's take a Christmas gathering, or let's take the, the, Christ, the Christmas carol function, or whatever we're going to do, let's take it and move it into a barn. The animals are real. The people are real. Mary and Joseph, uh, Joseph actors were, were there to play them, and the, you know, the shepherds and the wise guys and the angels. Everybody was there. It was all real people doing it. You're in a barn, so even the smells are real. Get my, me- get my message. The only thing that was not real in this Christmas in the barn was Jesus. He had a doll in the manger. And it probably makes sense. I don't think any self, you know, competent uh, parent would want to put their little baby in a manger for a few hours with all the strange animals and drafts and hay. So they had a doll sitting in, 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 in the manger. And there was this toddler that came to Christmas in the barn, and, and he started to walk around. He started to, to look and pet the animals. And, you know, he saw the people and kind of, you know, went over to them. And finally, he approached the manger. And he looked at this baby Jesus, this plastic Jesus that was laying in the manger. And he does what toddlers do. He started to poke the baby. And nobody really reacted. Because after all, what can a toddler do to a doll? It could be poked as much as you want. It's not going to hurt it. And so this toddler is just left, you know, poking this doll, closing its eyes, opening its eyes, all the things that toddlers like to do to babies. And we kind of shush them away as quickly as we can. Be gentle, be gentle, be gentle. Gentle with a baby. Janet kind of was, was watching this scene, and she, she thought, you know, that's not the way it was. Jesus came, he became flesh so that he could dwell among us. And he became flesh with all that that means. He became flesh so that he could be hurt. He could experience pain. There were days when he probably had a cold, didn't want to get up out of bed. He became flesh. I'm I'm getting older, so I'm kind of understanding this idea of flesh. You know, my my knees don't work the way they used to work. You can blame it on all the football I played when I was when I was when I was a teenager. My back's not quite right. Well, my knees didn't work, so my my back's all fouled up. I'm on a list of medications that is too long for anybody to be on. The Word became flesh. The Word didn't come encased in some plastic outer shell that could not be hurt. Jesus came and stepped into a world where he was frail. Here's how she puts it. And so it is here that we pause to marvel once again that the Word word became flesh. With all of its risks and all of its promise, Jesus became one of us. No, this is no plastic Jesus. Even we, if we have to use such as that to represent him in the barn on a Christmas Eve, this Jesus lived like us, as we did and do. Oh, just think it. Jesus stopping to, stooping to this for you and me. And of course, you know, sorry, and of course, you and I who know the rest of the story know exactly what happened to the Word became flesh, who lived and died among us. That, of course, is the greater, greatest wonder of it all. 
The Word became flesh, became like us, to dwell among us, even in this fragile state, a state that could die and eventually did on a cross for us. We have seen the glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Out of his fullness, we have received grace in the place of grace already given. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen the Father, but the one and only Son, who is himself God, and is in closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. We don't have a plastic Jesus. We have one that comes into our world, steps into our reality to tabernacle with us, to dwell among us. He is the first gift of Christmas coming from the sleigh. This is the one that's dropped off. And that can make a difference in absolutely everything that we do. That should make a difference in absolutely everything that we do. We become more generous, more willing to listen to what God has for us because the word has been made flesh and tabernacled among us. I, mm, say it. This week I had a meeting with a friend um, at Tony Romas. It was a bit of a different way that I got there, I guess. Um, I walked in. I was there first. And so I walked into the restaurant, and something wasn't quite right. And I was trying to figure out what was going on. There was a man who was coming out of the restaurant, and behind him was the waitress. And she was just about in tears, and she was trying to grab onto him trying to hold him. I kind of stepped out of the way again, didn't know what was going on, and watched as this guy left. He actually turned and, and pushed the waitress a little bit and then got enough distance that he could just leave and walk out. Meanwhile, the waitress is almost in tears. And I'm just starting to put pieces together. I'm a little slow. This guy skipped out on his bill. And she's going to have to pay for his meal. Because that's the rules. Finally, I got seated. And uh, she was totally flustered. She came for my drink order twice. She came the first time. I told her what I wanted. Then she came back and said, oh, can I get you something to drink? And I had the Diet Coke sitting right in front of me. I said, you already have done that. I said, oh, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm flustered. And she went off. My... Dinner companion was a little late, so I was just sitting there watching soccer and thinking. And somehow in that place, a still small voice said, Gary, take care of it. And I said, what? And it just kept on bugging me. It just kept on pricking me. You're going to say on Sunday that I am the first gift that we have received. And that's true. But I am present in you, and you need to fix this. My dinner companion showed up. We had a great, great dinner. Time for to pay the bill came, and uh, my friend went for his wallet to pay for the bill. And I stopped him. I said, no, don't, no. And he looked at me and I said, just listen to me and stop. Put your wallet away. And I turned to the waitress and said, you know that bill that you, the guy ran out on you? Add it to mine. And of course she said, no, no, I can't do that. I said, yes. My friend said, he's a pastor. Just let him do it. He does these things said, thanks a lot. 
put that bill on my, on my list. She wouldn't do it, so I left her a $22 tip uh, to hopefully pay for the bill of the, that the guy ran out on. We're not just changed in this shallow kind of way in which we call ourselves Christians, but it doesn't actually get anywhere else. The word became flesh, it tabernacled among us so that we would feel the generosity of a God who has picked us up from so much more than just a $20 skipped bill, who's made a difference in our lives so much that who we are today really is owed to him because he came and dwelled among us and continues to dwell among us. And that should change, not just everything that I do, but everything that we all do. The gift of Jesus has been given. The first one we received. There is a depth in it that even I don't think I have quite gathered yet. And all that God wants to do in our midst, in my life, in your life, everything that God wants to accomplish through us, because he dwelt among us and his spirit continues to dwell among us. We are different, even from the people who worshipped at that tabernacle, because the Holy Spirit then was given to certain people, and now he is given to all of us. And we get to, on a daily basis, see his glory, because it shines out in the lives of Christians that have accepted this into their lives and said, please, God, make me more like Jesus. My hope for you is this Christmas season that you'll allow Christ once again to tabernacle among you, to shape you into becoming more like so that we can go out and make a difference in this world of darkness that needs Jesus' light. That we, as the Christian church, would become Jesus with skin on and just go and make a difference wherever it is we go, with the small stuff. Obviously, none of us can, can you know, solve world hunger, but we can help out where God points and says, do you see what's going on over here? Gary, fix it. Okay, Lord. I will. Let's pray. Father, we ask that you would shape us. We desperately need your shaping. We are here celebrating the birth of your son. And we sometimes want to keep him in the manger where he's not dangerous to us. A little later when he grew up, he would sometimes make us uncomfortable. He would sometimes demand more of us than what we really wanted to give. But God, give us the spirit that says yes to whatever it is he's asking us for. Give us the courage to step out on faith and do whatever it is that you need us to do. We thank you that Jesus was our first Christmas gift. But more importantly, with the help of your Holy Spirit, God, make us Christmas gifts to those who are around us. Help us to love those who need to be loved. Help us to listen to those who need someone who will just hear their voice. Help us to see you and everybody that we meet this Christmas season and beyond. Use this as a change for us, a new beginning where you are our number one priority and accomplishing what you need accomplished in this world is what we really want to do 
Father, I know it will be hard, but give us the courage. Help us to celebrate this Christmas in a way that is maybe different from any other that we have celebrated before as we follow you through this season. And we will give you all the praise in the name of Jesus. Amen. God, we thank you that you sent your son as a child to live in this world, to live like us, and to show us the way that your glory came down and that your glory has not left. And God, we ask that you would allow us as we go into this world, into this season, to bring that glory to the rest of the world. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. And again, we just want to remind you, if you have tithes or offerings, you can send them in an email transfer to vpcctreasurer at outlook.com or drop them in the box at the front here. Let's end with one more song.
back out into the world. May the God of hope, who loves us and gave himself for us, fill us with all joy and peace as we trust in him. Today and throughout the coming week, to that, so that in believing we may abound in hope through the love of Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit. Thank you for spending some of your Sunday with us. We hope that you'll have a great rest of the day and that you'll join us again next week, 11 o'clock, right here at Vantage Point and on Facebook. Grace and peace. Have a great week. Dear child of mine